Brad Follins comes to read our scripture passage this morning. It's too bad we don't have the Apostle Paul here today because I think he would do a much better job with this reading than I will. I, I love this passage because it really expresses his heart, and so I hope you catch that as I read 1 Corinthians 9, 19-27 in the NIV. Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from Christ's law, from God's law, but I am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak, to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Pastor Steve. Good morning. Whoa. Starting with a bang. What a joy to... Thanks, Aaron, for your testimony. That was great. Appreciate that. Um, in this uh, season of Olympics, it's probably great to look at this passage from Paul where he talks about being a, a runner. But before I get there, I'm going to share with you some, some things by way of an elder report. We're going to do this a little different this year. I'm going to share just a few thoughts uh, each week for several weeks as I sort of unveil some of the things that we've been going through. Last summer... As many of you know, I got ill, and I went to the doctor. I don't go to the doctor often, and uh, so I did, and I was diagnosed with Lyme disease. Well, actually, that wasn't the most traumatic thing about the visit. Um, as usually happens when you go to the doctor, the nurse, God bless her, says, you know, step up on here, and she, she measured my height. Now, with that, I have to say, here's a confession. I've been lying. All my life I've said I'm 5'6". You know, when I was feeling real honest, I would say, well, almost. So, um, so I've been about, you know, 66 inches tall, almost, for a uh, number of years. And so I jump up on there, and she says, uh, 64 and a half inches. And I was just like, whoa, that's, that's not right. There's something wrong with your measuring, but you don't tell the nurse that she's wrong, because, because they can say, oh, Mr. Hardy, I'm looking at your chart. I see that you're behind on some vaccinations, <laughs> so you don't tell a nurse that you're, you know. So I, I go home, and I said, you can't believe what this, this nurse said, that I'm 64 and a half inches tall, and so dutifully backed up to the wall in our kitchen and had, actually it was really traumatic because one of the kids was there and we marked it off and 64 and a half inches. I didn't know height kind of ran like a bell curve. You know, you get to a certain height and then you start going down again, but that's, that's what happens. And so the point is, change happens. You can't control it. Everything changes all the time. I used to have a poster hanging in my room that said, He, Christ, is the still point in a turning world. That's the truth. You know, we call God our rock because He is the, 
the stable place to stand when everything around us is changing. Beth and I were cleaning some things out this week and ran across a cassette tape from a service in 2001 here, uh, my first year of ministry here. It happened to be, interestingly enough, the message from September 9th, 2001. that ring any bells? And the message was from Philippians chapter 1. You can rest now. Interesting. But what was more interesting was how different the service was. And it gave me pause to reflect on changes made incrementally and intentionally in our worship service in order to meet the needs of the flock better. And so as I was listening, it was it was amazing. The announcements went on and on and on. And there's like 10 minutes of announcements. Well, we don't do that anymore. You know, it's printed in the bulletin. We try to shorten how much time we spend talking about the stuff that you can read. All right, so that's a change that's happened. If I could have had a picture of the auditorium that morning, uh, it would have been a testimony to change because there would have been pink carpet instead of the gray carpet tiles that you have. There would have been pews instead of these chairs that you're now sitting in. And there would be some missing faces. And, wonderfully, some new faces. And so change happens. And while often difficult, it also sets the stage for growth and development in new ways. And so planning anticipates change when it can, and it directs change to the extent it's able. And so it's a positive thing. And many people have a different perspective on change. And some change is negative, but it can be very positive. And so it's the obligation of leadership to plan for and lead through change. Jesus modeled this when he was speaking to his disciples, teaching them, preparing them for what was to come. Matthew chapter 16, verse 21, he said from that time, it says from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed. And on the third day, raised to life. It was the plan of the triune God for our redemption. Its outworking required change that made the disciples very uncomfortable. Peter cried out, not so, Lord. Uh, it made Jesus uncomfortable, if you witness him in the Garden of Gethsemane. But ultimately, it's very good. The Elder Council has been meeting annually to take stock of where we are at as leaders and as a church and plan in preparations for the changes that will happen. In reporting on these sessions for the past couple of years, we've been anticipating changes to come and in anticipation affirming things that will not change. And so last year we came back and affirmed to you through some changed wording our mission and our vision, which is as the same, to call people to follow Jesus and become like him. That's why we exist. That's not going to change. We're not going to move off of that center of purpose that Christ gave his church. Make disciples of all nations. That is, make learners of me. And so we've affirmed what's not going to change. But then thinking about what does change, how do you plan? Well, the process is important. And I just want to highlight what I highlighted for the elders in thinking through the process of change. I don't know, if, did we get those slides up? on uh, godly strategic planning? We didn't. Okay. Maybe next service. So let me just share with you the foundation is prayer. Vision begins with prayer. And so we spend time in prayer. And then we seek God's wisdom. In James it says, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. One of the things we freely confess to you as we think about a building program is we lack wisdom. None of us have been through it. We don't know exactly what the best steps are. So we pray that God will lead us. Then discernment, sensitivity to the heart and will of God because we're here to serve him and his purposes. That's our agenda. We don't have personal agendas. Our agenda is to discern what God's will is for this body as we lead. And then obedience. What has God said? What are the non-negotiables? What does God say? Look at that. There it is. Obedience. What does God say that we must do 
And finally, trust. God approves of planning, but he despises presumption that ignores him. And so whatever we plan has to be in the context of trusting him. Now, it's possible to plan from an entirely worldly point of view. The next slide will show what that might look like. It may begin with research and reason, and so you gather information, and then you analyze it, and, and you can do this completely devoid of thinking about God. You think about probabilities, but you do this, again, with an autonomous approach. It's just about what we can think of, and you're making presumptions along the way in ignoring God. Well, our goal is to lead by utilizing all the resources God has given us to plan, both divine resources and those he has invested in us as humans made in his image. We can think, and it's not a bad thing to reason. And so what does that look like? Well, prayer guiding research. Prayer guiding research. We just received from IGC, Influencing Generations for Christ, the report that was generated from input you gave uh, through surveys and through interviews, number of you in the body involved in that, 650 pages plus input. That's research. And we need to digest that. We need to look at it. But we do that in prayer. You know, we, we want to prayerfully approach the information we've been given. Then obedience. Excuse me. Next, wisdom. Wisdom that informs reason. So we do need to think through things, but we do that in the context of God and seeking his wisdom. Discernment, infusing analysis, that is, as we analyze the data, as we do the, the study of the research, we do that with a heart to discern God's will in the midst of it. And then faith directing decisions. Uh, we want to make decisions that indicate that we are, in fact, trusting God and counting on the things that he's promised there are things we know by faith. Then obedience, determining our actions. We want to obey God in, in all the things that he reveals to us and trust evaluating results. So as we evaluate the outcome of the plans that we make, then we trust God that he's leading and working through the things that work out well and the things that don't. He's teaching us along the way, and we're growing as a result. So over the next few weeks, I'm going to take some time to give more details about things that we're anticipating in the years ahead and uh, trust that that will be helpful as you understand the elders. Some, Again, uh, the elders' retreat was not a playtime. It would have been nice. Uh, I did get one walk in, and that was a wonderful prayer walk with a good brother that uh, revealed things in a wonderful way. But most of the time, we were sitting in meetings praying and thinking about you and about this body, which we have the, the privilege and the responsibility to be a part of leading. Would you pray with me? So, Father, thank you for the opportunity the elders have to get away annually and spend some focused time thinking through where we're at, taking stock, seeking your wisdom, planning together. And so guide us as we do that and this body as we seek always to follow you faithfully. More and more, we would like to see the mission you've given us fulfilled, that people would come to faith in Christ and be growing as disciples to become more and more like Jesus. So we want for our lives. So help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Let's jump into 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I'd like you to turn there in your Bibles because I am going to refer to the verses that we were not read, beginning in verse 1 of chapter 9. We'll look at the whole chapter this morning where Paul talks about rights. I'm going to share with you a passage from the introduction to the U.S. Declaration of Independence. It begins this way. In Congress, July 4, 1776, the unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. 
We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. And so it goes on. I'd like to note three things about this declaration. Number one, the use of the word entitle. It means to qualify for or to have a legal right to something. Our forefathers made the statement that the laws of nature and of nature's God, go to the next slide, grant them the right to assume among the powers of earth a separate and equal station. That the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them to what? Well, to form a new government and dissolve the government that was previously in power. Uh, the declaration goes on to state this directly, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute new government. We're entitled to that. That's our right, according to the Declaration of Independence. Secondly, the concept of unalienable rights. Unalienable rights. We are endowed by the Creator with unalienable rights. Well, you won't find unalienable in most dictionaries. I had to search a bit. It means non-transferable. In other words, the Creator has granted us rights that cannot be sold, denied, or taken away. And again, the Declaration is quite expansive in assuming rights, including the right to alter or abolish a government, declaring later, in fact, that it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government. And so they claim that the Creator gave them that right and duty. And finally, government's role is, in fact, to secure these unalienable rights for the people. That's government's job. So our expectation from our very founding is that our rights will be secured and protected. It is our God-given entitlement. All of that to say that this concept of rights is woven deeply into the fabric of our national consciousness. It has become more and more evident that the way to force the will of one person on another person or to demand a significant policy change is to make it a matter of rights. And so abortion has been advanced by declaring it the protection of the right of women, totally disregarding the right of the unborn. Extending protection against discrimination regardless of moral conscience has happened by establishing identity groups and insisting on the equal rights of those groups. And you see, these campaigns are successful when they're made issues of rights because we demand our rights. It's the American way. In this section of Paul's letter to the Corinthian church, he continues responding to concerns that they've raised. And some concerns are apparently quite personal. People have attacked Paul and suggested that he really isn't qualified to be an apostle. He doesn't really have any authority. And part of the reason, it seems, was because he did not take the rights that were the rights of other apostles. He's not exercised some rights that would be his. And his explanation provides guidance to the serious follower of Jesus in contemplating this whole issue of rights and our response to them. I'm going to suggest at the outset that this, this will be on edge for you as a, an American. Because as I've pointed out, going all the way back to our Declaration of Independence and right up into every modern controversy that we have in the government, we demand our rights. Is that good? With our identity, we have certain rights. So notice with me, Paul, chapter 9, verse 1. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are not you my workmanship in the Lord? 
If to others I'm not an apostle, at least I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. And again, the basic premise here is the one we operate under, that, that based on your identity, you have rights. And so Paul says, my identity is as an apostle. And so as, as an apostle, I have rights. As, as a citizen, you know you have rights. As a member of a particular minority group, those rights cannot be denied. As a human being, you have certain rights. Rights are, in fact, a reality that is biblically affirmed, though we might argue in the application of those rights, uh, what happens when the rights of one conflict with the rights of another? Well, here's where Paul's situation proves instructive. Paul's identity as an apostle is clear, verses 1 and 2. Some have apparently questioned his authority, and so he begins by affirming his identity. It goes back to Acts chapter 1, verse 22, the point made when the disciples after Judas departed, we're going to appoint another to take Judas's place. One of the qualifications was that he be a witness to the resurrection with the other 11. And so Paul here asserts, have I not seen Jesus our Lord? I mean, he's qualified. Further, he attests that they as believers who have come to faith through his gospel ministry are the seal of his apostleship. He is an apostle which means he has those rights that would be given that identity. He has those rights. What are they? Well, some of them are rights that are assumed by other apostles. Notice he continues in verse 3, This is my defense to those who would examine me. Do we not have the right to eat and drink? Do we not have the right to take along a believing wife, as do the other apostles and the brothers of our Lord and Cephas? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working for a living. What's he saying? Well, first of all, the other apostles have the right to eat and drink. That implies they have a right to be provided for as they're going about doing ministry. And, uh, and the, they have that right to gain support from their work in the gospel. That's his idea. They have a right to take along a believing wife. The other apostles did. Paul, we saw, chose not to because of his preference which he indicated back in chapter 7. Because of this present distress, he thought it was more profitable to remain single, and so he chose to do that. He set aside that right he had to be married, carry on his ministry. Having a wife and family would have meant for Paul, as he recognized, responsibilities, legitimate responsibilities, that would have hindered his ability to serve the Lord as he did with extensive travel and often life-endangering situations. He set aside that right. Nevertheless, it was a right he could have demanded. It's his right. There are then rights that are inherent in social circumstances. Notice verses 6 and 7. He continues, Is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working for a living? Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard without eating any of its fruit? Or who tends a flock without getting some of the milk? And so he, he alludes to these other kinds of circumstances, social circumstances, where those who are involved in a particular thing gain fruit from that. They're supported by that. A soldier serves and is supported by the government. A vineyard owner receives of planting, and one tending the flock partakes of the milk of the herd. These are things that they would all readily agree to. Of course that's the way it is. There's a right to support for those who are laboring in a particular area. And then there's rights extended by the law. It continues at verse 8. Do I say these things on human authority? Does not the law say the same? For it is written in the law of Moses, You shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. It is not for oxen God is concerned. Does he not certainly speak for our sake? It was written for our sake, because the plowman should plow in the hope, and the thresher thresh in hope of sharing in the crop. If we have sown spiritual things among you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? If others share this rightful claim on you, do not we even more? Paul says, I have a right to gain support. An ox is not to be muzzled. They are to remain free to eat as they're plowing. And Paul asserts 
this principle in the law is actually for the sake of humans, those who are the plowman and the thresher share in the crop, extending this principle by implication. Those who sow spiritual things, he says, those who preach the gospel, those who serve the body of Christ on behalf of Christ, they have a right to share in material things from the flock they serve. He points out this precedent was set in temple service. Look at verse 13. Do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service, they get their food from the temple, and those who serve at the altar share in the sacrificial offerings? This was a precedent set from the Old Testament. And so, uh, in social circumstances, it's demonstrated that there are rights that the worker has, and finally, there are rights established by Jesus himself. Verse 14, in the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. Essentially, Jesus affirmed what asserts that the servant is worthy of pay. When he sent out the twelve, this is what he said. Acquire no gold or silver or copper for your belts, no bag for your journey, or two tunics or sandals or a staff, for the laborer deserves his food. So as the disciples went out, the expectation was that as they served, as they preached, as they proclaimed the gospel, they would be supplied what they needed to subsist, to live. They would be provided for. If you want to talk about rights, Paul says, I have rights. They are inherent in his identity as an apostle. They are recognized in other social circumstances. They are extended by the law itself And they're affirmed by Jesus. I have rights. And if Paul wanted to act like an American, he would get his back up in the air and begin demanding his rights. I missed this story in October when it happened, but somehow I picked it up on the news this week. McDonald's. McDonald's tried to capitalize on the fans of the Rick and Morty show. It's out of production Szechuan dipping sauce in an effort to sell more chicken tenders. Anybody remember this story? It kind of went under the radar, I think. Unfortunately, the supply of the sauce was seriously limited, and police were called to at least one outlet after people in queues for the sauce began getting angry and chanting, we want sauce. (laughs) Things turned sour when fans, who, according to reports, had queued for hours in some places and were told there was no more sauce. While at a restaurant in Newark, angry customers held up protest signs to demand the sauce they had come for. All right, now that might be an urban legend. But CNBC went on to report that single packets of the sauce were sold on eBay for $280. See, that's the other American way. Capitalize. We demand our sauce. Do you believe that? Yes, you do. Because that's the American way. Demand your rights. So, what are your rights? You know, we have a whole social system built on the concept of rights. Everyone has a right to food. Right? Everyone has a right to food. Well, is that what the scripture says? I think if you read carefully in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10, you'll find it says that if a man is not willing to work, neither let him eat. Now, make careful note, not willing, the issue is not willing, doesn't have to do with ability. If a person's not able or whatever, that's that's, that's when others step in and help. If a man's not willing to work, Neither let him eat. The Thessalonians were thinking Jesus is coming soon, so we're just going to kind of sit back and, you know, maybe watch TV and wait for Jesus to come. And Paul said, oh, no. No, you don't do that. 
What are your rights? And do you demand your rights? It's an attitude issue. And perhaps there's a time when it's an appropriate thing to do, to demand your rights. But please note carefully, rights may be set aside for the sake of the gospel. Rights may be set aside for the sake of the gospel. Sometimes there are more important things at stake than getting what I'm entitled to. And that's what Paul says. Notice with me, uh, verse 12, he continues, uh, as he says, if others share this rightful claim on you, don't we even more? Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right, but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. So Paul is purposeful in relinquishing rights. He affirms that he has the right to support, but he did not use it because he was willing to put up and endure anything rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. It was his practice to support himself as a tent maker in ministry, at least in many of the times and many of the contexts in which he ministered. While in prison, he was undoubtedly supported by friends and in other places undoubtedly received the support of those he served. But many times he simply worked in the tent making industry that he was a part of. He makes clear his reason for this choice to relinquish the right to support that he give no hindrance to the gospel. Notice he continues at verse 15 to say he's not writing now in order to gain that support. Verse 15, but I've made no use of any of these rights, nor am I writing these things to secure any such provision. For I would rather die than have anyone deprive me of my ground for boasting. He says, look, I'm not trying to manipulate you now. I'm not trying to say, look, I have this right, and you ought to be meeting my needs here. You Corinthians that ought to be providing for me. He doesn't know. He says, I don't, I don't want you to do that. That's not why I'm talking about this. I'm making another point here. He seems very concerned that some would infer he was motivated by money rather than by pure interest in promoting the gospel. And so he's very careful. His boast is that he freely offers his service. There can't even be a hint of mixed motive. And on the other hand, he is, he is not completely free. Notice verse 16, For if I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting, for necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. Why does he say that? Well, the obligation he has to preach has to do with Christ's call on his life. He understands that the gospel ministry he's involved in is a stewardship that God has entrusted to him. And so he has to be faithful in pursuing that stewardship. Notice back in chapter 4, just look with me. He says, this is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. Paul's not concerned about advancing his rights, getting the things he's entitled to. He's concerned about being faithful to God's call on his life. He must be a faithful steward of the message of Christ that God has entrusted to him. So he's not free in that sense. He's under obligation to Christ. He understands gospel ministry is an entrusted stewardship to which he must be faithful. So he feels the obligation to Christ to fulfill his calling. Verse 16, for if I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting, for necessity is laid on me. It's an obligation to Christ. It's not about money. It's not about position. It's not about control. It's not about authority. In fact, the word right is related to the word for authority. He says consciously he's not serving to gain authority or rights. His reward is the faithful discharge of what has been entrusted to him. Again, verse 17, For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am still entrusted with a stewardship. That's what it is, stewardship. And so he affirms the sincerity and genuineness of his ministry. Verse 18 what then is my reward that in my preaching I may present the gospel free of charge so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel? 
I'm not going to make full use of my rights. I'm going to let them go. Why? For the sake of the gospel. I don't want anything to hinder the gospel. Now, he will expand the principle to say the priority of the gospel ministry tempers both rights, as he's been talking primarily about his right to support, but also lifestyle. Lifestyle. Paul continues by saying, verse 19, he is free. For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. So he makes himself a slave to everyone, and, and this, my friends, is a different approach to life. Heeding the call of the Lord Jesus, who said in Matthew 20, verses 26 to 28, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So what does this look like? Verse 20. Notice what he says. To the Jews I became as a Jew in order to win the Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. And so by, he says, by adopting a lifestyle conforming to the Jews who are under the law as far as and to the extent that Christ allows so as not to offend them or create a hindrance to the gospel when he was ministering to Jews. And so he became like one under the law when he was ministering in that context. Notice verse 21. As he continues, to those outside the law, the Gentiles, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. So to the Gentiles, it meant conforming to their lifestyle to the extent allowed by Christ. Again, as a way to make inroads for the gospel. Now note, note his careful explanation. He's not free from God's law, being under Christ's law. This is a, this is a longer deeper and very important discussion of the believer's relationship to the law as a rule of life, not as a way to life. As a rule of life, not as a way to life. See, we are we're very urgent to say you're not saved by keeping the law. You're not saved by works, for by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. So it's not of works. But what is your relationship to the law? Well, it remains God's explanation of his righteousness in human terms. And so it's not the way to life, but it is, as Paul suggests here, the rule of life. So, to the extent that he could, he would conform to the practices of those he was ministering to, but not in disobedience to God and God's law. Now, this could be confusing if you don't think it through. So, let me just give you one example to try to, to make sure you understand what Paul's saying here about how he lives in relationship to the law. When he was ministering in a Gentile context, he would argue forcefully against the Judaizers who insisted that those who came to Christ must keep the law and so be circumcised. And so he argued forcefully against that, saying, no, you do not have to be circumcised in order to be saved. You don't have to keep that aspect of the law. And then almost seeming to be a, a conflict with that, as Paul is getting ready to go minister among the, Gen the Jews, and he takes Timothy with him, Timothy whose father was a Greek, Timothy who had not been circumcised, he has him circumcised before they go. He said, now wait a minute, Paul, why did, you, why did you do that? Because you didn't have to do that. You said you didn't have to do that. Right, why did he, why did he do it? Because he was going to minister among the Jews. And he didn't want there to be any hindrance to his ministry among the Jews. See what he's saying here? I'm not free from the law in the sense that I can do anything I want. It's not 
lawlessness. I still operate under the rules of Christ, but I'm, but I'm able and free to act different ways depending on the context I'm in, all for the sake of the gospel so that I put no hindrance in the way of people hearing the good news about Jesus Christ. So he continues, notice verse 22. To the weak I became weak that I might win the weak. I've become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. Remember the conversation in chapter 8. It's about meat sacrificed to idols, and some were weak. Their conscience is defiled and they're led into idolatry if they see somebody eating meat that was sacrificed to an idol. So Paul says, if I'm among people like that, I'm going to be like them. I'm going to be weak and I'm going to not eat meat sacrificed to idols. Why? I could. I'm free to, but I'm not going to because I don't want to hinder the gospel. So to the weak I become weak. So he says, I become all things to all men so that by all possible means I might save some. All for the sake of the gospel and its proclamation and the hope that Christ would be embraced in faith by those he ministered to. In concluding our study of 1 Corinthians chapter 7, the point was made that the Christian life is centered in Jesus Christ and to be lived out with undivided devotion to the Lord. It is a Christocentric life and that's Just exactly what Paul is giving evidence of here. Everything for Christ. It's not about me. It's not about my rights. It's about Christ. It's about His ministry. It's about living for Christ. To what extent? To the extent that there is a willingness to adjust every aspect of your life within the bounds of righteousness and love established by Christ, every aspect of your life in the pursuit of his calling and the trust he has given you as his disciple. It's a disciplined life in the service of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why he ends with this illustration in verse 24. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run? But only one receives the prize. So run that you may obtain it. So his illustration is a runner in a race. Now, in a race, many run, one wins. That's the nature of a race, a running race. Many run, one wins. While in the Christian life, many will receive the reward. Paul says this when he writes, concluding his life story and talking about the hope he has in 2 Timothy He says, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me in that day. He's going to win. He knows he's going to win. And he says, not just to me, but to all those who've loved his appearing. Right? So we're going to win. If you're in Christ, you're going to win. So so it's not a perfectly pure illustration, but what he's using is, is to say, how does the runner run? Because in a race, only one wins. The runner runs with discipline. It takes discipline. And so you're running the Christian life like a runner would run in a race to win. You're going to discipline your life so that you can do your very best. Many of us have been watching the Olympics and have heard the background stories of these people. It's, it's incredible. Training, some of them training with partners if they're like the pair of skaters and stuff since they were children together. Years Years and years of training. And in the context of that training, they exercise self-control in all things, in their eating, their drinking, their sleeping, their training schedule, all things. It's a good chance I will never in my life win a running race. It doesn't mean that much to me. I'm not going to stop eating ice cream. But if an Olympic athlete will exercise self-control in all things to win that perishable prize, how much more should we who anticipate an imperishable reward, how much more should we discipline our lives for the sake of the gospel? 
for Christ. So that's what he says. How much more worthy the prize we seek. An imperishable wreath as distinct from the perishable one. So, so what does Paul say by way of personal testimony? He lives his life purposefully disciplined to be faithful to Christ's call. And in that process, he is fully willing to relinquish all rights if it's necessary. He'll relinquish all rights for the sake of the gospel. Our culture is conditioned to demand rights. You're an American. You're conditioned to demand rights. I want my sauce, or whatever it is. And we'll riot over fast food dipping sauce, for crying out loud. Almost as if we feel to do so is our obligation or our duty, as stated in the Declaration of Independence, to pursue and to have our rights. What an attitude. And with a completely opposite attitude, the believer will relinquish rights and modify the various aspects of his life for the sake of seeing others come to faith in Jesus Christ. Become all things to all people. Why? So that more will come to know Jesus. It's the gospel priority. In the negative, as much as possible, do nothing to hinder the spread of the good news that Jesus has provided for our salvation. Paul says, I'm not going to do anything to hinder the gospel of Christ. In the positive, I'm going to live my life in such a way that when I'm among the Jews or later among the Gentiles, I'm going to do everything I can to engage with them, to connect with them so that I can share with them the good news of Jesus Christ. Negative, no hindrance to the gospel. Positive, building in roads to share the gospel. Living purposefully, lovingly engaging the people around us. It's about the daily choices we make and who and what we make them for. Think about this. The choices you make, the choices I make every day, do you know what they say? They tell everyone what our priorities are. They tell everyone what's really important to us. What's important to you? What attitude will you take about your rights? Is the gospel a priority for you? Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for the opportunity to open your word. Thank you for Paul's testimony that as a follower of Jesus, he viewed his life ministry as a stewardship, a trust to which he needed to prove faithful. Even when, for the sake of the gospel, it meant relinquishing rights, rights to support, rights to a wife, rights of all kinds, even sacrificing his very freedom being imprisoned for the cause of Christ. We are conditioned to demand rights by our culture. Father, I would ask that you would help us examine our own lives and our attitudes. And by the help of your Spirit, really be discerning about our own thinking attitude with regard to our rights and our willingness to become a servant to all for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Oh, that we might win others to Jesus. When it comes to some of the, the cultural controversies that are going on in our world around us. And we're 
anxious to pronounce our rights and, and our moral viewpoints. Help us to think carefully about the impact of every word and every action on the need to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Let us contemplate with all seriousness the gospel priority and the first need people have. The need that must be met before they'll understand your righteousness to know Jesus as their Savior. And embrace with Paul this gospel priority. Ask it in Jesus' name.